Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of PBS Wisconsin's online gardening series, Let's Grow Stuff. Welcome to this year's virtual Wisconsin Garden and Landscape Expo. I hope you'll enjoy this special educational presentation, and remember, you can leave your questions for our presenter at any time by typing them into the chat, and we'll ask them in a live Q&A at the end of the session. Also, don't forget to stick around and check out everything this virtual event has to offer. From inspiring garden tours to an interactive exhibitor mall, there's something for everyone. And thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Aaron Wynn, farm manager here at Victory Gardens. Let me show you our garden. Here we have our community garden where we rent out garden boxes to community members. Here we have our food forest where we grow a variety of fruit and nut trees and we had an excellent elderberry harvest this year. Here we have our produce area where we grow the majority of what we provide to the community daily. And at the back of our farm, we have a huge compost pile that we use to grow food. With this compost, we keep about one ton of food waste a day out of the landfill. Alex is here now making our compost. Hey. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm the composter here at Victory Garden Urban Farm, and I'm here working on our main compost pile right now. At this compost pile, I take waste products and turn it into high nutrient soil to grow food. Every day I dig a hole in our compost pile to add organic materials. Pretty big. At Victory Garden, we get our waste materials from local businesses such as grocery stores, cafes, and breweries. Digging the hole helps to aerate the compost, and adding the fresh ingredients into the hole helps to initiate decomposition. After a couple of months, this will be soil that's ready to be used on the garden. This is some of our finished compost. Let's bring some over to the farmhouse. Uh, Hi, Montana. I brought you some soil. Oh, thanks, Alex. <laughs> Hi, I'm Montana, and I run the Victory Garden Blitz program, where we install raised vegetable gardens all over the city of Milwaukee every spring. Today, I'm going to teach you how to make one. To build our four foot by eight foot garden beds, we use one yard of this 50-50 compost topsoil mix. We use three eight foot boards and some drill and screws to put it all together. The first step to build in your garden is to choose your garden location. You want to make sure that your garden spot has lots of sun and is on nice level ground. Today I'm going to show you that you can even build our raised garden beds on concrete and reclaim urban spaces maybe up against the side of your house and grow food. Today Erin and Alex are going to help me put together this bed. First, they're gonna cut one of the eight foot boards in half, and those will be the two short ends of our garden bed. Now we're gonna attach our boards together. We're gonna use three screws on each corner to hold the boards in place. If you want, you can drill pilot holes to help avoid cracking. It's good to do this part with a partner, so one person can drill while the other person holds the board. Once we're done drilling the frame together, we're ready to fill it with soil. We are using a 50-50 mix of some topsoil that we have and some compost that Alex made on the farm. After you dump in the yard of soil, you can rake 
make it all nice and level so that it's ready for planting. Lavender is a perennial here in Wisconsin and perennials are good to be transplanted in the spring and fall. So we're gonna transplant some into our new garden bed. Now we're gonna transplant our perennial herbs into our new raised garden bed so that Joya always has fresh herbs to cook in her kitchen. Our Victory Garden Blitz program installs 500 of these raised garden beds every spring all around Milwaukee. We raise money to install 50% of these gardens into the lowest income neighborhoods in Milwaukee at an affordable rate. So growing food is accessible to everyone. And here at the Victory Garden, not only are we showing people how to grow food, but we're also showing people how to cook it. Come on, let's go see the newly renovated community kitchen. Come to the crib. And this is our community kitchen where all the magic happens. My name is Joya. I am the community outreach coordinator here at the Victory Garden. And it's my job to take the delicious food that we grow on our, on our farm and bring it here to turn it into something even more delicious. We do community meals, we teach cooking classes, and we do all of our preserving here in this kitchen. Over the summer, we've been preserving things like tomatillo salsa, marinara sauce, sun-dried tomatoes, and some hot sauce. Over here, I have some dried lavender that I'm going to take and put in this jar here. And I'm gonna use them for a multitude of things, like um, infusing in oils, um, making tea, or making scented sachets or soap. One of the next steps for our kitchen is to get our commercial kitchen license, where we'll be able to rent out this space to community members who want to start their own cooking business. And our kitchen is connected to our community classroom. Here is where we host our in-person classes and special events. Right here, we are preparing for our elderberry syrup virtual class. And for all those herbalists out there, this is just a small amount of the dried herbs and berries that we have collected from the farm over the summertime. Victory Garden Initiative is a nonprofit organization located in the Harambe neighborhood of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Our farmhouse is on Concordia in Richards and our urban farm is across the street on Concordia. Our focus is primarily on helping communities grow their own food and creating a sustainable and socially just food system. VGI for me is a place in the middle of the city where people can connect with their roots, connect with their neighbors, spend time with their families. And it's just like this little oasis in the middle of town. I love it so. It's a focal point for the community where, you know, there is no focal point. So it's a place where everybody goes. And I, that's what I like about it. It's not just for one group of people, but for all people. Victory Garden Initiative. I think it's an opportunity for people to take a good look at some of the, the roots that we've lost. I, it gives us a chance to think about the earth and the fertility of the earth, how we use space, especially in an urban environment. It's an intersection of communities, and everybody in the equation is educated. Um, white allies and employees, black and brown neighbors, um, black employees. So it's an intersection in the gumbo pot and everybody's educated and in some small way, I think, healed by doing this work. What is the Victory Garden Blitz? Uh, that's in May. That's when everybody gets uh, out and puts plants, trees, and uh, they build uh, boxes at places. Victory Garden Blitz is a big effort to build beds um, around the city for the most part at this point um, and help people that want to have their own little garden. Usually what five or six hundred that you have to do in like less than a month and that's hard. And it takes a lot of volunteers, a lot of people with pickup trucks, a lot of backbreaking work. And sometimes the first step of getting a garden going is tough for people because they might not even have the ability to, to put a box together and fill it with soil. So here in Milwaukee, you know, we're, we're an urban environment and 
everybody, every different community has different access to green space that could be used for growing food. Some places have open space, open lots, others don't. And sometimes those lots, even if they are open, the ground is really not compatible for growing healthy food. So us installing these garden beds and getting these into different places, into backyards or churches or schools, wherever they go, really provides a lot more infrastructure, but it also provides it in a different way. A lot of nonprofits build community gardens, they build gardens, they grow food and urban farms, but those are usually owned by an entity, whereas we're putting these in the hands of actual people and individuals to control. How does gardening make you feel? Gardening makes me feel like I'm part of the flow of the season. It makes me feel um, happy, healthy, and nourished physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Um, it relaxes me, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> I get to meet more people this way. I have more friends and family that way. And uh, it's good for you. To grow something, cook it, and serve it to my family, that is hugely fun and rewarding. So I feel peaceful, I feel meditative, I feel calm, and I feel connected. Whether you eat a whole meal of things that are grown from your kitchen, from your garden, or from, or just a piece of it, it helps you feel a sense of sovereignty, like this is my life. I'm not just waiting to see what's chosen in the store. It's my life first. When people ask how they can get involved with the local food system, with growing their own food, they're often, usually they're asking because they feel overwhelmed. They, they don't know what they could possibly do to make a difference in the local food system or to make a difference in their own diet or um, bottom line for their budgets. So usually my suggestion is to start really small. Either you've got you know, an org or a business or a community garden nearby that you could reach out to and say, hey, can I tag along and just learn a little bit from you? Or to just start in their home with, with some sort of small thing they can grow, whether that's a little windowsill herb garden or something like that. So I would say cooking. Cooking is a huge part of changing your personal food system. Because once you learn how to like take a green or take a mustard green or take a herb and turn it into something that you really actually want to eat, then you really have a purpose and a reason to grow it. Because someday after gardening enough, you'll walk into a supermarket and maybe you'll realize how many flavors we really are missing, how many tastes we no longer have access to. What is your favorite thing about VGI? I always felt like VGI had this incredible strength of inventiveness and and the structure of it and the people involved always allowed that, allowed people to like make mistakes, you know, or try something new or do something a little different. And that's been a very powerful thing, is that I that spirit of inventiveness, the spirit of let's try it. No one else is doing it, you know. It's being around the people, just being around people helping others, you know, and, and being part of that is, you know, it's always has always been part of me, being part of something where it's helping others, and that's what VGI does. Hi, I'm Ben Fudo, host of Let's Grow Stuff. Well, we just finished learning about the Victory Garden Initiative in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and growing big in small urban spaces. Michelle and Montana are now joining us live to answer many of the questions that you were sending in during their presentation. And as a reminder, you can keep asking those questions as we're chatting here, either wherever you may be watching, whether that's Facebook, YouTube, or in the live stream chat itself. Michelle and Montana, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Morning. Thanks well, for having us. Well, Michelle, uh, we'll start with you. Um, we had a question come in of sort of what was the farm before it was the farm? What did that original space look like and how long did it take to convert to what you're doing now? The farm used to be Concordia Gardens and it is, a, is an acre and a half. It was just people were growing food there. Um, we transitioned into um, this space. Victory Gardens started living in the space across the street and then we acquired the farmhouse um, in 20, 2009 we got the land and 2017 or maybe 18, I'm sorry, Montana, was, is when we um, got this building across the street. 
it's covered in a mural that was donated by a local artist. And um, our community classroom and kitchen are downstairs and our offices are upstairs. Well, Montana, we've had a lot of questions coming in about raised beds um, from, your, from your demonstration and a couple about drainage specifically. So folks wondering, um, is, how does drainage work if you're doing this on, say, concrete like you were doing, um, but also uh, you know, thinking about plant root space? Are there plants that will do better in a raised bed on concrete than a raised bed on soil? Yeah, definitely. So um, the drainage is still about the same if it's on concrete, um, unless you were to like put a whole sort of rubber barrier or something down that would keep it from draining, um, which you could do. Uh, you would just have to be more careful about the amount of water that went in there. Otherwise, it'll drain normally, um, you know, kind of like if you were to build a raised bed on top of some clay or something else like that. Um, so building on concrete is pretty awesome, especially for urban places where there's just already too much concrete. It can help to reclaim that space a little bit. And it works really well for most crops. Um, definitely some things that don't work as well, like potatoes or things that go way down into the ground um, are not going to do as well. You know, you could do smaller carrots, but really huge long carrots or big parsnips, you know, things that are gonna grow more than like the, the depth of the bed, like over a foot down um, are not gonna do as well or they'll just be a little stunted in the raised bed. Um, and then perennials are another finicky one like demonstrated in the video where um, you can easily grow perennials in there, but depending on how big and how old they start to get, they might just be stunted eventually by the shape of the box. So it's good if you do have perennials in the bed that once they get big, you might split them and transplant some or transplant them to a bigger location from there. So Michelle, we have a question from Jean and she's wondering how many volunteers are involved in this project and is it, is it citywide? We do citywide. We are focused in a micro-organizing way on Harambe, but we serve the entire city. There's hundreds of volunteers that come through here in a year. Um, for our Garden Blitz, there are literally dozens of people out day after day installing these beds. Um, and there are volunteers in the kitchen, in the classroom. So yeah, we're largely um, volunteer powered, which is, which is wonderful. It's great. Yeah, volunteers are, are make the world go round, really, in a lot of ways. Uh, Montana, yeah. Carl, Carl has a question for you. Uh, the type of lumber that you use for raised beds, does that matter? And what are some things people should look for? Yeah, we generally recommend you use untreated lumber. Um, it might not last as long, but it'll still last a long time, like probably at least a decade. Um, and so it's really worth using a lumber that's not treated so you're not getting those chemicals leaching into your soil. Um, we just use a pine because it's cheap. Um, and again, pine might not last as long as some hardwoods, but we try to make these like as cheap and accessible as possible. So untreated pine's a good way to go. So Melissa is wondering, and Michelle, you might uh, take this one. Uh, she says, first, it's so good to see all of this amazing work and sharing happening in the city. And she's wondering, how can people go about requ requesting a raised bed for their property? Our website's going to be live tomorrow. And in the meantime, uh, you can place an order there on a form we have. But you can always email helpusgrow at victorygardeninitiative.org to either get a bed at your house sponsor a bed at your church or school or any open space that you, you're in charge of where you'd like to grow. We'll install it. Rooftop bananas. It's wonderful. You can grow just about anywhere. I love it. Uh, Montana, cool. we've, we've had a lot of questions coming in. People noticed some uh, sort of half moon shaped objects that are white in the garden and folks are wondering what those are, if you're able to share. Yeah, so we get a lot of um, materials from a lot of local businesses that generally would go to waste and we find ways to reuse those. And so those are barrels that we've cut in half um, that are just kind of like a waste product from a local factory. And we use them as like miniature cold frames. So if you're growing things at the beginning or the end of the season where the temperature is a little chilly for them, we just put these little half barrels over top of those crops um, to help keep them warmer longer so we can have food for longer. 
Excellent. Uh, Michelle, one for you from Nicole here. She says, I'm interested in starting a community garden of my own at my church. Any suggestions for getting started, licensing requirements or things that she needs to be aware of or think about, anything like that? If she's using the church grounds, there's not much to it. You put down your soil and install your sides if you want to. Sometimes people just, if they have um, open land that they'd like to uh, grow on, they put down newspaper or burlap, cover that with half topsoil, half compost, and start planting. It's There's a, no license required. Excellent. Uh, Cheryl has a question here, another uh, um, raised bed question, maybe from Montana. She says, I'm looking for ideas to get a taller raised bed, um, you know, to help out with some joint issues, so not as much bending over, but without having to fill that really tall raised bed with soil. Any ideas for how to sort of balance those two out? Yeah, that can be a tricky one. A good way to go, the best way to go would be rocks. If you have lots of rocks you could fill with your existing raised bed, um, that's going to generally be the cheapest way to go. Um, or you could try filling the bottom with lots of wood and things like that, which will break up over time. So you'll have to keep adding, um, but it'll be, it'll be easy if you only have to add like a little bit of extra soil each year. So Michelle, Rita is wondering, is the, are, is the farm and garden open? Um, if she's driving through Milwaukee, can, sh can the public come in and visit? And what does that process look like? Absolutely. Feel free to stop by anytime. Our hours, if you're looking for some guidance from, for somebody to be on the land, we're there from about 10 to 5 or 6. In the summertime, we're there until the sun goes down. Um, and every month, we have almost like a block party where we're cultivating. We call it Cultivate Harambe. So the neighbors all come out, we eat something that we grew, listen to music and hang out on the land. But you're welcome, anyone's welcome to come by at any time. Wonderful. We also have field trips we arrange that with our, our outreach people. And I assume all of that is on your website as well, that kind of info if people wanted to check out there as well. Yep. Perfect. Yep. And remind us the, remind us the web address again, uh, if, if folks want to check that out. VictoryGardenInitiative.org. And again, we are online. And a reminder for viewers as well, again, this is a, a recorded talk. So if you need to go back and reference anything that our guests are covering, um, these are recorded on Facebook, YouTube, um, and on the Garden Expo website as well. So you can always come back and reference. Um, so Becky on Facebook is wondering for composting. We have a lot of composting questions coming in. So, uh, Montana, they're wondering, are flavored coffee grounds OK to add to compost? Or should we be looking at just uh, plain coffee grounds? Well, composting, and from my perspective, is really more of an art form. Um, so it's kind of all up to your own discretion. Um, it, there might be some extra additives in there, but if you're already drinking that coffee, then you're probably okay with you know having that those same additives in your soil, and it probably won't cause you know too much detrimental damage. Um, to the soil compost. So yeah, I think adding those kinds of things is gonna be such a minuscule difference. Um, the bigger differences are going to get into, you know, the things that you really don't wanna add, which are gonna be like meat products, um, stuff like that, which will give a really rancidness to your compost pile and probably cause a lot of pest issues as well. But flavored coffee should be okay. And uh, Val was wondering, um, and maybe Michelle, you can take this one. How do you go about collecting the compost items? So, you know, you were showing in the video, you're collecting from a lot of different locations, but sort of what does that collection process look like? How does that happen? We, Alex, our compost manager, literally gets in his truck. He goes to collect the coffee shells. He collects um, wood shavings from a local woodworker and food from grocery stores on that starting to decompose anyway. It's gone a little too far to sell anymore. And so he buries it and turns it over into the compost pile. And it breaks down out there. Excellent. Uh, Montana D is wondering, uh, how should she think about rotating crops in a raised bed? You know, knowing that crop rotation is important for plant health. If you're growing in that small space, how can somebody sort of think about that idea? Yeah, well, one way you can try to rotate if you really want the same crops every year, you can try to, you know, put them on this side one year and that side the other year. Um, it might not be as effective as, you know, if you had two beds and rotate stuff from one bed to the other, 
Or maybe um, you don't grow a crop, crop one year and you make a plan with your neighbor and then they'll grow more of that crop and then you can trade produce. Um, that's a good way to do it. Um, but in terms of the crop rotation, most crops do pretty well being um, regrown year to year if you're growing them on a small scale. And it's usually um, affects your braised bed more if you're only growing one crop in that bed. So if, especially like tomatoes, which use a lot of energy. So if you're only growing a big bed of tomatoes, it would be good to maybe mix it up a little for the next year. Um, but other than that, if you're not doing something so intensive, just mixing it up a little within the bed should be fine. Excellent. Uh, so Michelle, Melissa is wondering, um, what uh, does your watering look like? Do you use rain barrels, city water? Um, sort of how, how does the irrigation system work? We harvest our water on the farm. Um, and we, of course, use rainwater always. We don't have a lot of like city pump access. So we, we harvest and use rainwater for our crops. And then one more question coming in here for probably uh, Montana on composting. She's wondering, um, uh, this is from Marie, and she said, I have a compost pile, uh, but she struggled to really get the materials to break down, and she th feels like she might be missing something. Is there something you add to the compost, or sort of how do you approach? You, you mentioned composting as an art form. Um, so what are some things that folks should think about in, in that way? Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely more a spectrum of passive and active composting. And if you're just throwing things down in a pile, um, they it'll be passive, it'll take a lot longer time to break down. So that's the one thing to be considering. The other thing is really having a balance of nitrogen and carbon or like green and brown materials. So your vegetables, scraps from your kitchen and everything would be more nitrogen heavy. Um, and then brown things would be more like dead plant matter, dried leaves, wood, um, stuff like that. And having a nice layering system between those kinds of materials um, will help the ingredients to break down faster. Um, also making sure that it has moisture and needs moisture to break down. So if you have a lot of dry materials, adding water will help it to break down faster. And then a big thing that really helps it to break down is if you're turning it. So if you want your compost to break down even more quickly, you can do a regular turn of that compost pile to oxygenate it and that'll help to speed things up. So Michelle, we have a question from a viewer wondering about uh, pests and critters in an urban environment and how that might look different than say growing in, uh, in a rural area. How do you approach um, sort of working with or, or controlling for things like raccoons or other, other things that might be in the city? Um, we have several cats that live on our land. We have cat shacks out there that we've built so they can um, hang out. They're all... Um, chipped and neutered uh, by, by the Humane Society so they can live outside. Um, and our neighbors also help take care of the cats. We had a, a family of groundhogs uh, a couple seasons ago, and we just planted more squash for them <laughs> because it, they, that's their favorite thing. We had a row of squash, and that's what they ate. Um, I don't think that we have problems with pests as, as far as eating our crops. Um, and when it comes to live trapping, if something really is a problem, especially in our in our yard here or in the building, we live trap and release them. Just put them up. Perfect. Staff cats. I know a lot of public gardens that have staff cats as well <laughs> to, to help out. They're wonderful. They are yeah. wonderful. Um, Montana, a viewer is wondering, uh, do you ever trial winter sowing? So sowing things over winter, either as cover crops um, versus, again, spring planting. Um, we've done a little bit like in those half barrels that I've talked about. Um, we've been, done some spinach through the season um, in those kind of systems. And we've also done in the past where we had a little hoop house that we would put on top of our compost pile. And because the compost pile um, creates so much heat as it's breaking down, we've actually been able to grow like a lot of, like have a fig tree that stays alive all year outside um, because it's on this compost pile. So we do small amounts here and there. We're getting a new greenhouse this year that we're gonna install um, to help with more year long growing. Um, but it's been fun experimenting with different methods. And so we're, we're coming into our final few questions here, it looks like, and I have, uh, it looks like one last one here from Michelle. 
Um, do you know of a Victory Garden project or a community like this in the Madison or Janesville areas that you could refer people to? We don't have one in Janesville or, Ma or Madison, but we do have one in Green Bay. Janesville is not that direction. But people keep approaching us about how do we join? How do we start a Victory Garden in our area? And we get like two or three requests a week from as far as Houston. And so that's what we're focusing on this summer. Like once we get growing, um, how do we help other people do this in other places? Because our focus is so intensely in the Milwaukee area. Um, but now that we've got the hang of it, I think that we're going to start exploring that. Please be in contact with us and we'll, we'll work it out. We'd love to have one in Janesville. That's excellent. And again, you mentioned so much of this is local and so community driven that it really starts in, in community. So I think that's a wonderful thing. I'd also, uh, I know personally, uh, Rooted here in Madison does some community garden work as well um, for the viewer who is asking that as well uh, as another organization to check out. Um, so it looks like uh, one final comment uh, here coming in from Jill, and she just says this, you're, again, your work is incredible. Uh, she's in awe of everything that you have accomplished and that you're doing, um, and she really appreciates you sharing, as I'm sure all of our viewers do as well. So thank you again so much for joining us, for sharing your experience and your story. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone, please do stay with us. We have, again, more presentations coming up this afternoon, but right now it's time for the virtual exhibitor booth live streaming. And also a personal question for all of you. Uh, again, as you know, I do host Let's Grow Stuff and we're getting ready for our second season. So we're looking for ideas for what you'd like to see us cover. So please send those questions to gardenexpo at pbswisconsin.org. And you never know, it may just turn up in a series uh, this year. So do stay tuned and send us those ideas. Well, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you back here in just a few minutes.